Lord, I thank you for what you put on my heart. But Lord, at the same time, I do not want to try to communicate these deep spiritual truths in my flesh. Because that will be of no value for any of us. But Lord, we need you. We need your word. We need you to give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Lord, these truths that we're going to look at today from your word, uh, they're going to hit each of us in different ways. And so, Father, with that task being too big for one person, I thank you for the fact that all you ask me to do is to be your mouthpiece. And I rest in that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Just got back from a 10-day preaching trip in Virginia and North Carolina. And while I was in Virginia, I did a whole series Sunday through Wednesday on being ready for the return of the Lord, yet patient. And I'm going to take some of the things from one of those messages today to kind of challenge us as well from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Listen to verses 1 through 8 what Paul writes. And as you'll, tip, you'll be able to tell, he's near the end of his life. If you know anything about Paul's life, there was a point earlier on he was in a prison in uh, Philippians chapter 1, and he wasn't sure if he was going to live or die. But by the time he finished writing chapter 1, he realized that God was going to keep him alive in the body to help them in their faith and their, and their encouragement. Now at this point, though, he's in another prison in Rome, and now he realizes that his time is at the end. And there's something he says here that I think God wants to challenge us with. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. We could spend days just in this section of Scripture, but there's a few things I think God wants me to pull out, and we're also going to use a lot of other Scriptures to kind of illustrate those points. But Paul charges Timothy to preach the Word, and he tells him to preach it in season and out of season. Have you ever meditated on that? What the difference is between in season and out of season? There's going to be opportunities for you to preach the Word that are just set up for you. But there's going to be other times that you're going to be able to preach the Word without knowing you're preaching the Word except just sharing the Word of God in situations that you don't know that it's going to bear fruit down the road. Sometimes we plant. Sometimes we water. And sometimes we see a harvest. Do you understand? Amen. In the same way, we need to be men who know the Word of God so that we can preach what? Our opinions? No. The latest philosophy? No. The seven steps to the Christian life? No. no. The Word. We need to know the Word. But there's very important, he says, we're to do it with patience. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. That's going to be very important for us today. But he also says that there's going to come a time, and we're there, when... Men are going to be accumulating. That word never really jumped off the page at me until just recently. He says, the people are going to not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Now, stick with me here a little bit. If, do you not read the word accumulate to mean gather more than a couple? Yes. There's going to be a lot. Back in the day when I started preaching, I've been preaching now for 40 years and 40 years ago, when I started preaching full-time, if you were going to be a preacher, you had to be licensed, you had to be ordained, there was a whole process you went through where churches would examine you and you'd go through hours of counsel and grilling, and then a church would either say yes or no to whether or not they thought that the call of God was on your life, and they would ordain you or not ordain you. Nowadays, because of social media and the internet and all that, anybody that wants to be a preacher or a teacher of the Word of God can just put a shingle out. Make a YouTube channel. Let me just say this to you. There's a lot of people out there that claim to be preachers and teachers of the Word. 
And unfortunately, not all of them are going to be sharing with you the truth. And if you don't know the Word of God, how are you going to be able to tell who is and who isn't? We can't check their credentials like we used to could. Find out who ordained them and who sent them out. And so I just want to challenge you. That Word sure makes a lot more sense today, doesn't it? You couldn't accumulate teachers back in the day. There was one or two. Now they're everywhere. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says that we're to test the spirits to see whether or not they're from God. In other words, there's going to be other spirits that are going to be talking to you, even claiming to be from God. The Bible even tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we're to not treat prophecies with contempt, yet we're to hold to the good and reject the evil. In other words, we should listen to what people are saying and then decide whether or not through the Spirit it's truth or not truth. And so that's why the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. They checked everything that Apostle Paul said against the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. And so, guys, if we're going to be men who share the Word of God, we need to know what the Word of God is. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, we're going to jump down to the end of what he says, and we're going to spend most of our time there today. He says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What I want to do today is I want to talk to you about, as men, how to fight but keep the faith. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are really good at fighting. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us don't know how to fight by keeping the faith. You see, we're to stand firm in God's Word and faith in these last days, but the Bible also tells us, and we're going to see other scriptures that illustrate this, mm -hmm. that we're to do it with patience and gentleness. Let me say it to you again. The Bible tells us that we're to stand firm in God's Word and faith in these last days, but we're to do it with patience and gentleness. Those last two words of that, 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 that phrase there, patience and gentleness, are just as important as standing in, in God's Word and in faith. They're just as important. You know why? Because when you share the Word of God with patience and gentleness, you're actually showing your faith in God and His Word. When you share the Word of God with your own anger, with your own volume, when you share the Word of God to win an argument, you actually aren't showing faith in the Word of God. You're showing faith in what? Yourself. Yourself. That's why Paul over and over says, preach the Word. Reprove, rebuke, but do it with patience and gentleness. There's a lot of us that are nowadays become real proud of the fact that we're standing against evil. Mm -hmm. But is anybody seeing Jesus Christ in us as we do? You know in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, it talks about how we need the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. So that we won't be tossed to and fro by every wind of teaching and cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful schemes, but we will grow up into Him who is the head. But I left off a couple of words. It then says, speaking the truth, what? Love. In love, we're to grow up into Him who is the head. As you're going to see, Paul, as he was charging Timothy to preach the Word, knowing that as the world gets worse, and it's going to... By, by the way, I don't know if you guys know it or not, but the Bible's being proven more and more and more true as we see what's going on in the world. Aren't we? Didn't the Bible say that there wasn't going to be this great revival at the end, which a lot of churches tried to preach for a long, long time? Didn't the Bible say there was going to be increase of wickedness, godliness, the love of most will grow cold? And we're seeing it happen in our day. But that doesn't mean that we're all to sit by and just say, well, you know, it's just going to go that way. We have to trust in the fact that God's plan will be accomplished and He'll use those who lit Him. Yet at the same time, we're to stand firm. We're to fight the fight of faith. But we're to do it with gentleness and patience because we believe the Word of God is powerful enough all by itself. Look back again at 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Look what Paul says to Timothy here. He says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, that's encourage, with complete patience and teaching. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Back up to chapter 2. Look at verses 24 through 26. He says, well, let's, we'll start in verse 22. Check 2 Timothy 2, 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, 
correcting his opponents with what? Gentleness. God may perhaps grant, grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Jump over to Philippians chapter 3. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Here's Paul himself teaching a powerful truth in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. He's talking about how he's forgetting what's behind, straining toward what's ahead. Look what he says. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now look at what he says next. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And... If in anything you think otherwise, how dare you, because I'm an apostle of God, I've been appointed by God, did any of you ever have Jesus teach you face to face? By the way, did I kind of get away from the scriptures? No, there? Yeah. no look what he says. He says, if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Isn't that interesting? Paul could have easily pulled out the capital A apostle card. The signs and the wonders. The fact that he had been taught by Jesus face to face in the desert of Arabia. Paul could have just said, hey, I'm an apostle. What I say can be called scripture. He didn't use that. Even when he was writing to Philemon about Onesimus, he said, I could command you, but I'm not going to do that. Because I want your obedience to not be because you were commanded. I want your obedience to be because you love. And the love of Christ will be demonstrated that way as you choose to follow. By the way, let's, let's be honest. For those of us, anybody here a servant of Jesus Christ? And I hope every one of us can say we're yes, a servant sir. of Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Well, let me ask you a question. Could he force you to do what he wants you to do on a daily basis? Sure. 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 Oh, yes, he could. Mm -hmm. But does he? No. 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 He's patient. Mm -hmm. He's gentle. Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, get to work. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Look, we have a tendency sometimes in the day and age in which we live, especially as men, to think something needs to be done. You ever heard that one? Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to do something. And when we start acting in that way, we actually start doing things that we think, and we're convinced, this is the right thing. And we get mad at each other if you don't feel the same way. Come on, don't you think we should be doing the same thing? What's your problem? But a lot of times i found in the Bible when men try to act in their minds righteously to defend God, they actually are working against the plan of God. You know, in Matthew 16, Jesus starts, to, if you want to double check me later on, verses 21 through 23, He starts telling His disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'll let them kill me. And about three days later, I'm going to rise. And what does Peter say? No way, Lord. By no means. I'm not going to let this happen. That's the wrong way to handle this situation. And what does Jesus gently do? He turns around and He says, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Jump over to chapter 26 of Matthew. See, a lot of us would have thought that Peter would have learned his lesson there, but he didn't. That was Matthew 16 where Jesus said, Satan's talking through you right now. You don't have in, things in, mind, in mind the things of God, but the things of man. So in Matthew 26, Peter still hadn't caught it. Look at verses 47 through 54. Matthew 26, starting in verse 47. While he, Jesus, was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Listen to what Jesus says next. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and He'll at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? 
By the way, it doesn't tell us, other Gospels tell us, who's the one who pulled his sword out and cut off the servant's ear? Peter. Peter. It was Peter. The same one who had just been told a few days earlier, look, don't try to stop me from going to the cross. But he still did. He was convinced. Now, if you do a little bit more research, you'll find Jesus had just a few uh, hours earlier in Luke 22 said, if you don't have a sword, get one. So he thought he was doing the will of God. He even thought he was obeying the Word of God. But at the same time, he was off a little bit. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I know it's going to be hard for some of you to believe. But I've been preaching for 40 years, and after you've been preaching for 40 years, you read the Bible a little bit more, and you look back, and you realize you were off a little bit a couple of times. And as I look back over my years of preaching, I'm a little embarrassed at some of the things I used to say when I was a young preacher. But I'm glad God's able to use donkeys. <laughs> I'm glad He's able to use rock-headed people or rocks. I'm glad He's patient and He knows who He's working with. And guys, I want to ask you to trust in the power of the Word of God, not your interpretation of the Word of God, but the power of the Word of God. And when you believe something strongly, share it. But... Don't stay there until the other person agrees. Do you understand? Had Peter understood what Jesus had said? And did Peter come to agreement in chapter 16 of Matthew? Obviously not. But Jesus shared the truth. Later on had to share some more. And in time, Peter's going to get it. In time, Peter's going to get there. And when they do get there, it isn't because you convinced them. It's because the Lord did. And to be honest with you, the older I get, the less I care about whether or not anybody agrees with me. I want them to agree with God. I want them to agree with God. Sadly, though, we're not only needing to stand firm in faith against the world, but also against false teachers, teachers within the church. So how do we handle false teachers within the church? Listen, the exact same way. You don't try to root them out. You just preach and teach the Word. Go to Acts chapter 20. Let me show you what I mean. Go to Acts chapter 20. Look at verses 28 through 30. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 28, Paul says this. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves, I love that, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. He's talking to the Ephesian elders. They're meeting in a town called Miletus. Paul doesn't think he's going to see him ever again. And so he says to them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Notice how he doesn't give them a step process on how to handle it. Notice he doesn't talk to them about constitution and bylaws. What does he talk to them about? God and His Word. It's enough. It's a, yeah, but Jim, don't you think we should also... That's the problem. That's not standing in the faith. That's not keeping the faith. Real keeping of the faith is not only believing for yourself, but acting as if you really do believe the Word of God is powerful enough. Do you really believe that God's going to accomplish everything that He said He would accomplish? Do you really believe that? Okay, listen then don't think He needs you. Amen. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. When I talk about the fact that His Word won't return void, it'll accomplish everything He set out to accomplish. When I talk to you about the fact that everything's right on schedule, when I talk to you about the fact that everything that He has said will be accomplished, and it, He's already set the day of judgment. A lot of us are, have been taught wrong theology. We've been taught that God's waiting on us to finish the job. You know, we've always heard people say, and as soon as the gospel is preached to the whole world, then they will come, and as soon as we get the gospel to the whole world. Folks, let me say something to you, what the scripture tells us. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Amen. If we don't speak, the rocks will cry out. Like I've already jokingly said, he can use donkeys if he needs to. Listen, he isn't waiting on us. The day of judgment, Acts 17, 
verse 31, says very clearly that the day has already been set. When, it talk, when Peter talks about us speeding and his coming, it doesn't mean that we do more to hurry up and get it closer. Mm -hmm. It's just simply cheering it on. We hasten, we cheer it like the third base coach going like this. You know, <laughs> come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. We're ready. But it's already all in motion. So we could easily sit back and say, you know what? Jim says it's already all in motion. We're, we just sit back and watch it happen. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to miss out if you do that. Oh, he's still going to get his stuff done. But that isn't what he told us to do. He didn't tell us to sit on the wayside, on the sidelines and, and watch it go on. He's actually called us as men to be leaders in our homes, in our families, in our churches. He's called us to fight the good fight Amen. by faith. By faith in the Word of God and God Himself. And we're to fight how? With gentleness and patience. Ralph, and as a pastor, isn't that something we have to learn over and over? Amen. Because as pastors, we deal with, well, we deal with a lot of dirty diapers and sucking thumbs. <laughs> and sometimes it can be very hard to change the diaper again, especially when this kid should be out of diapers by now. Or this lady in our church shouldn't be sucking her thumb anymore. And sometimes we get a little frustrated, and sometimes we want to say, Aah! But God says, hey, um, do I have to remind you how patient I've been with you? Years ago, I was talking and met this one pastor the first time, and I was speaking at his church for the first time, and I was going to be there for a week. And so I met him. We went to dinner, and then I, he took us up, took me over to the church building and gave me a little tour. And I, he was started grumbling about all the people that sat on the back row of the church, how they wouldn't get involved. He goes, doesn't matter what I try to do, it don't matter how hard I yell, they just move. They're a bunch of lazy no goods. And I said, hang on for a second. Remember back when we were at the restaurant and I asked you to tell me your testimony? Tell me how you got saved. Tell me how you came to Christ. Tell me how you got called to the ministry. He goes, yeah. I go, I remember in your testimony that you actually used to be one of those people that sat on the back row of the church. Oh, yeah. Isn't that what you told me? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, well, how'd you end up in the front of the church? He said, well, God. I said, then rest in the same big God. That if he said, get them there, he'll get them there too. You just love on them, share the word, keep planting it, keep watering it. And if you get to see a harvest, praise the Lord. And if you see a harvest, don't pat yourself on the back because it's God who does it. Amen. But we have a tendency sometimes to forget how patient God's been with us. How many dirty diapers he's changed with us over the years. How many times we've continued to suck our thumbs. And folks, let me just tell you, when you allow the truth of the Word of God to sink into your heart, and you don't add to it your flesh, but then you act in faith, you go out into this world and you can scatter seed. Amen. But our problem is, is we've been taught to measure results. And if we don't see results, then we're not effective in our minds. Correct? I mean, I, I'm Southern Baptist. I, I was... I grew up in a non-denominational church up in New England. We, we, the town was so small, all the Protestants met in one building and the Roman Catholics <laughs> met in another. I mean, I didn't even know what a Baptist, Presbyterian, anything like that was. I just know that the little community church I was a part of uh, when I grew up that my dad was pastor of, I had a christening bowl in the front and we had acolytes and we said the Apostles' Creed. We had a mixture of everything that was Protestant back then. It wasn't until 1984 when our family moved to Florida that I even knew what a Southern Baptist was. And I got partnered up with them. And you know what I was taught in a lot of Southern Baptist life, especially in the ministry? Count your baptisms, count your offerings, compare it against every other church, challenge the churches that aren't meeting their quota. And you know what happens when you start measuring results? It pulls you out of the abiding relationship. It challenges you to come up with other methods that may produce results. And by the way, you can produce results in the flesh. Let me just tell you this. It wasn't until years later that I realized a lot of what I had been taught, which was church work, was actually the flesh. Instead of resting in the power of God. And just doing what He said to do. So how do we deal with false teachers? Are they going to be false teachers? Yes. Go to 1 Timothy 6.
Tell me if this isn't something we might be hearing in some of our churches today or even on TV. Start in verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 3. He says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and doesn't agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and he understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. By the way, let me stop real quick. Are you somebody in your church that every time anybody sees you show up on Sunday or Wednesday or whatever day you're there, then a little leery because you're going to start hammering your same thing? Mm -hmm. Whether it's Calvinism or Arminianism mm -hmm. or pre-trib or mm -hmm. post-trib. or Are you known for the fact that you have taken a stand mm -hmm. on a certain doctrine mm -hmm. and you're pretty much known as a controversy person? Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. But listen to what these people were teaching. They have an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and a constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, financial gain. So are there people that are teaching that if you obey the word of God, you'll be rich? But Paul goes on and says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take a hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God. Didn't this sound like what he just said in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy? I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take a hold of that which is truly life. O oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what's falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Look at what Paul said. He said, look, there's people out there that are going to be teaching in the church that godliness is a means to financial gain. That's bad teaching. Teach the truth. Challenge people in the Word of what the Word says. And he never says, go get those people out of there. <laughs> Who's going to deal with the false teachers? God, the Lord. God, the Lord. We're to share the truth, live the truth, preach the truth, do it gently, avoid quarreling, and trust that God is able to separate the sheep and the goats, the wheats and the tares. Do you understand? But when we think it's our job, because we're defending God, you've just shown that you don't believe in a very big God because He needs you to defend Him. Think about that for a second. Can you imagine if you've got a two-year-old and the two-year-old has decided that someone has done you wrong and that two-year-old has decided that they're going to fight whoever it is on your behalf, you could say to the two-year-old, um, I really love that attitude, but um, it's stupid because I'm way bigger than you and if I needed to fight a fight, I definitely wouldn't choose you if I wanted to win. And God says to us, I don't need you. Oh, I'd love to use you. But here's how I use you. I use you by having you live a holy life so no one can check what you say against what you live and then find you to be a phony. But I also will use you by you just sharing my word in truth, lovingly, gently, and patiently, believing that if they're going to get there, that it's my getting them there. But Jim, haven't we been taught to resist the devil? Hang on for a second. You didn't quote the whole verse. 
Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. We've never been taught to go attack Satan or fight Satan or storm the gates of hell. Actually, we see in the book of Jude that when the, Michael, the, the archangel Michael was arguing with Satan over the body of Moses, he didn't even dare rebuke him. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. This is an archangel. Dude's got a little authority and a little bit more power than us. And how many of us have been taught around to go in, I cast Satan out of here. I command Satan to be gone. I, I, I. Um, read your Bibles, guys. In, in Hebrews chapter 2, it says that everything has been in, given and subjected to Jesus. Yet, at present, we don't see everything in subjection to Him. Has all authority been given to Jesus? Is He exercising that full authority right now? No. no. For His purposes and His reasons, He's left Satan here on the earth for a while. For His purposes and His reasons, even though He saved us and we're new creations, He left us in these bodies of flesh. By the way, I'm starting to understand why. Because God wants us to live by what? Faith. Faith. Faith and reliance on Him. And He left us in these bodies that are telling us to do the opposite every day. Wanting to do the passionate desires and evil desires and covetousness and all these things. And God left us in these bodies as new creations with His Spirit within us. And He says to me, and He says to all of us, if daily you will just lay that flesh that I left you in on the altar, and you turn to me, I will empower you to do things that you supernaturally could not do apart from me. Oh, and by the way, I've left you in this world and Satan is still the ruler of this world for a season. Oh, one day he'll be removed and the kingdom will be handed over to Jesus and his followers forever and ever. But until then, stop trying to go defeat Satan. I told you to just walk with me. Keep your eyes on me. Years ago, I got caught up in the whole demonology, fasting for 24 hours and praying, casting demons out of people. A wonderful old senior pastor sat me down. He said, Jim, grab your Bible. <laughs> he said, uh, would you not agree that Paul probably was one of the most powerful prophets and apostles of God? I said, without question. He said, how often did he talk about Satan? He spent all his time pointing people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Pointing people to Jesus. He said, if you start fighting Satan, you're going to find him everywhere. Right. And he wants all of your attention. Let me say something to you. When you're under attack, it's not directly Satan. Mm -hmm. He can't be everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. So get over yourself. You know what I've also found sometimes? When Satan has been allowed to enter an attack in my life, who gave him permission? Mm -hmm. Without my father's permission, Satan can't do anything to me. Or you, if you're a child of God. Remember how when Jesus walked on the earth, He was 100% man and 100% God. And when He walked on the earth, the humans only could see physical Jesus, but the demons, they saw who? They saw God. They knew who He was, and they went, whoa, we know who you are. By the way, do you realize that as a child of God with Jesus Himself living within you, when you walk on this earth, the demons see the real thing? Well, the humans might only see physical us, but the demon side, the spiritual forces of evil, mm -hmm. they know full well who indwells you mm -hmm. and they can't touch you. Mm -hmm. That's why they have to go to your father for permission and he sometimes allows them. Mm -hmm. So listen closely. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed in the Lord's Prayer where he touches, teaches us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, and then it says, lead us not into temptation? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but doesn't James 1.13 say God doesn't tempt anyone? Mm -hmm. Oh, but he controls whether or not we're allowed to be tempted. And that's why he's also taught us to pray to him, deliver us from the evil one. Lord, if you say yes in this situation to allow the enemy to have an attack, mm -hmm. uh, you have a reason and a purpose. Deliver mm -hmm. me from the evil one as I turn to you. That's why in Ephesians 6, when we fight against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, we're to take on the armor of the Lord. We go to him. We keep our eyes on him. Mm -hmm. We trust in him. He deals with the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so, guys, I want to challenge you. Fight the good fight, listen, of the faith. Real faith is demonstrated with gentleness and patience. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself stood before Pilate. And Pilate stands there with all his authority and the backing of Rome behind him and all that comes with it. And Pilate himself, if you read it, you can see he's starting to get a little frustrated 
because he knows deep down this guy's innocent and he is more afraid of what everybody else is thinking, the Jews and the Romans and his wife. And Jesus won't help him. Mm. He just stands there silent, just like the Scripture said he would. Mm. By the way, when the Jews were interrogating him, they said, Are you the Christ? And his answer was very interesting. If you go read the Bible, he says, You have said so. Well, they never said he was the Christ. Yes, they were. You know how they were saying that he was the Christ? By the fact that they were arresting him and putting him to trial and doing all the things that the prophecy said that they would do. So when Jesus said, You've said so, he says, All your actions are proof that I'm the Christ. Because I'm fulfilling the scripture. So he stands before Pilate and he says, Don't you realize? Pilate says to Jesus, Don't you realize I have the authority to have you put to death or released? Do you realize who you're talking to here? And what we're not talking to here? And I love it. The same Jesus that could have called 12 legions of angels. The same Jesus that could have just levitated Pilate off the ground and dangled him for a little bit, kind of like Darth Vader would try to do. Or you know what I'm saying? What does Jesus do? He says, you'd have no authority over me unless it was given to you by my Father. In other words, I'm not even looking at you. Mm. I'm looking beyond you. Mm. And He has allowed this for His purposes, and I'm to submit to it. And aren't we glad that He did? Amen. Guys, how many people in your family, how many of your friends, how many of your co-workers are going to miss out on some blessings of God because you tried to fight the fight? Instead of humbling yourself to God and sharing the truth and living the truth gently and patiently. When we get to the end of our lives, I pray that our family and our friends can say, that man was a gentle, patient man because he trusted in a very big and powerful God. I love you guys. Thanks. Amen. Thank you.